Good evening, friends, and happy Sabbath. So wonderful to have you joining us here. And those of you watching online, we just want to say welcome to the University Church and welcome to our camp meeting experience. You have been totally blessed, I know, if you've been following along with us. But if you're catching us for the very first time this evening here in person or online, we know that God is going to do something really meaningful in your life. As you engage with the book that has caused a lot of confusion, caused a lot of fear, but when understood in the right way with the character of God, we see actually a Lord who cares so deeply for us. Tonight, we are really going to be blessed with our speaker. He is one of our uh, professors here at the School of Religion, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Rosario. He has uh, done many things in his life. We'll start with the, least, with the least common denominator. Between the two of us, he worked at McDonald's living burgers like I did when we were teenagers. No, but he uh, started off actually as an instructor at Light Bears. It's a wonderful ministry led by Ty Gibson, David Ashrick. Phenomenal ministry goes around the world. And uh, I've heard many of his sermons and lectures that he's taught to young adults and adults all over. Uh, he then had a wonderful experience at the University of Cambridge where he got his doctorate in history and spent some time there in England. And then we were lucky enough to snag him here at the university in Loma Linda to be one of our professors, that he's been a, a wonderful blessing to our campus. So this evening, he will be presenting on the topic of Revelation as a political document. Before we get into his presentation, I'd like to invite each one of us into a moment of silence as we pray not only for our lives, but that we take a moment to pray for our nation. You know, every time we get before kind of a political season, you could say now, taking the sermon topic into real world here for us now, many times it's said that the church members become a little bit more hotly debatable about things. They get a little more excited. But it also causes God's people to get more distracted, I would say, too distracted in a sense that we start focusing so much deeply about this world we forget about the world to come so I do want to encourage us to not forget that we're living for a world that is coming but yet we still need to pray as as the book of Romans calls us to, to pray for our leaders both religious and those in politics and so we're going to take some time to pray for our church leaders pray for the leadership in your homes pray for the leaders in our nation and around the world. And then I'm going to ask uh, maybe if we would consider one final moment of prayer. And that would be praying for anything that you're yearning that God would do in your life. To show up in a way that you might see that he cares. So take these two prayer requests in silent for about a minute. And those of you watching as well, if you would take a moment to be in prayer are these two things, praying for our leaders and then praying that God would show up in a way that we would see that he cares in our life. So do that now. Incredible God, we come before you this evening on the eve of the Sabbath here in Loma Linda. And Jesus, we want to first off say thank you. Thank you, merciful God, for all that you have done. 
Thank you for being the God of both justice and mercy. Thank you for being the God of love and judgment. Thank you for being the God who is both compassionate and at times can reveal a righteous anger. Lord, thank you for also being a God who is so deeply concerned for our personal lives. While the world rages in so many ways, Father, you know the ways it rages within us. The battles that we face, the dark seasons that we don't share, and you understand. You have so much care for us. And so, Jesus, you heard the prayer requests of my brothers and sisters. God, I pray deeply for each one who's both in this room and who is watching, that you would reach them, that you would reveal to them, I am with you. I have not abandoned you. As you declare in your word, Matthew 28, there at the last chapter, I will be with you to the very end of the age. And so, God, thank you for being such a God that is with us in the midst of whatever we're going through. Thank you, Father, for Pastor Miguel's leadership in this Friday evening program. Lord, thank you for the speakers that have been present each evening, but we specifically want to pray tonight for Dr. Rosario as he presents this message for your people. Embolden him, speak in spite of him, and God, bring him a sense of peace as he steps on this stage. We thank you, Father, for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Blessings to you, friends. Dr. Rosario, the time is yours. Thank you, Pastor. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. It's hard to see you all, but I trust that you are out there. Hi, Annette. Annette's here. I feel better now. Um, so this is a topic that's obviously heavy, right? Whenever I'm on the airplane and, and we do small talk with somebody sitting next to you, they always ask, well, what do you do, right? Where are you from? What do you do? And when they ask what do I do, I tell them, well, I'm a professor and I do research and I write. And they say, well, what do you do research on? And then I always say, well, I keep it light. My research is on religion and politics, right? <laughs> so it's like you can't even take one step forward on this. Uh, it gets really thick, really edgy, really quickly. But not tonight, right? Not tonight. Tonight, um, I just want to explore this idea, this concept, which is a fascinating concept, a fascinating topic, really, uh, revelation as a political document. Um, revelation as a political document. And as we enter into that topic, uh, on the menu today, I had planned first to talk a little bit about the content, the textual content in the book of Revelation, and what are some of the political implications, basic political implications, as we just engage with how the book confronts us, the reader, right, at a very basic level. And then I wanted to move from there to talk about some historical examples of when a religious community or when a believer reads the book of Revelation and walks away with the political implications and then, and then seeks to engage their world in their particular historical context with what they see in Revelation's political vision. So we'll see if we can even get there, right? So when we talk about a political document. I guess the first question is, what is politics? And I need your help here. Um, I don't have a, a squeaky clean dictionary definition for you. I was just asking Pastor Philip, hey, what is politics? Because I need to talk about this, but what is it? <laughs> uh, what is politics? So help me out. Um, any volunteers, if you gave me a one sentence definition, politics is dot, 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 what would you say? How would you capture that? Politics. Can somebody help me? I was told this is a bit of a dialogue. This is a, a casual dialogue where you're not just listening to me. Um, anybody? What is politics? Please. Okay. Making decisions as a group. So the collective, right? Maybe the collective enterprise of, of how we live. Maybe decisions as a group. Okay. Thank you for that. Anybody else? Ooh, social contract, okay, which is related to what you just said, right, as a group, 
somehow we're tethered together. The maneuvering of power. You had to get fancy, right? Okay, so the maneuvering of power, which could be positive or it could also take negative implications. Okay, what else? Belief system. Ooh. Okay, politics as a belief system. Very interesting um, to hear your answers because I was also thinking what, what is politics and trying to figure out how do we crystallize? How do we come up with the definition? Now, I don't have anything to improve on what you just said, but, but politics, you would agree with me, which is my first point, is more, and I know that in our part of the, uh, our part of the world, our part of, uh, uh, in, in this country, the word politics or the notion of politics often gets collapsed to liberals versus conservatives, right? That's politics. Or Democrats versus Republicans, right? Or the left versus the right, right? So uh, tonight, I appreciate your, your, your responses because we're thinking about politics in a broader, a, bro a broader conceptualization of what politics is. And I think... We can say, I think we could agree, based on some of what you all said, that politics at some level is an individual's relationship to structures, right? An individual's relationship to structures. Now, in certain contexts, we can say politics is an individual's relation to authority or an individual's relation to the state, so as I'm talking, you're thinking in the back of your head, okay, revelation as a political document. Okay, so politics raises questions such as power, the abuse of power, human rights, law, right, and the enforcement of law. What is, what, cons what constitutes a legitimate government? These are all questions of political theory, political philosophy, right? This is all the realm of politics. What constitutes a legitimate government? And in what scenarios, under what settings, can a government be rightfully disobeyed? Okay, this is all the realm of political theory, political philosophy. So, with all that stuff, all that junk on the table, right? Revelation as a political document. Is revelation a political document? Now, we put all that on the table, and if, if politics is the relationship, an individual's relationship to structures of power and authority, I would say that when we approach the book of Revelation, you don't get, too, you don't even, you don't get past the gate <laughs> without getting confronted with, in, with the realm of the individual's relationship to power and to authority. So I think, I think emphatically we have to say that revelation has massive political implications. Now, that's a loaded thing, right? That's a loaded concept. But in the book of Revelation, and I want to insult your intelligence. You've been meeting here every Friday for I don't know how long. You've been hearing revelation for your Saturday morning service. So I don't mean to repeat things you already know, but revelation depicts Two kingdom principles, right? Two antagonistic principles, and they are on a collision course, right? On the one hand, we have the kingdom of Jesus, and then on the other hand, we have the kingdoms of this world, and they are on a collision course. And the book of Revelation depicts, yeah, the, the tension, the points of tension between those two kingdoms. And here's where it gets really fascinating. The believer, those walking in the ways of Jesus, are citizens of both the kingdom of Jesus and the kingdoms of this world. Are you with me so far? Yeah. Now, would you agree with me that that is a complete mess? <laughs> and so it raises the question, what does one do who is trying to walk in the ways of Jesus when your citizenship to the kingdom of God is in tension with your citizenship to the kingdoms of this world. What happens? Well, fireworks happens, right? That's the point of tension. And so as we get into what we call the apocalyptic literature of the Bible, 
we realize that the book of Revelation is in this, in this line of, of tradition, in this genre of literature, the apocalyptic, right? We realize, as many scholars have pointed out, that apocalyptic literature of the Bible is closely tied to a critique of empire. So Revelation is, is, exists in this genre that is very closely tied to the critique of authority structures, to the critique of the abuse of power. Okay. We get that very early, very early in the game. We get that when we think of the Old Testament, for example, the apocalyptic literature in the Old Testament. Scholars point out, for example, in the book of Daniel, as one person put it, Daniel is writing and he is steeped in uh, the radical political um, Hebrew resistance literature, right? When you read the book of Daniel, you, you read, depending on what tradition you're reading from, you read about empires, you read about nations, you read about the rise and fall of empires, you read about uh, the unfolding of history, and I'll get to that in a second, right? I'll get to that in a second, but, but what, do you, you, what you're, really, you're reading there is a tradition that is steeped in the critique of empire and, and what empire represents. So in the New Testament, the apocalyptic literature of the New Testament follows in that tradition, hence we get to the book of Revelation. And people have been obsessing for the last dec several decades about the book of Revelation's emphasis on empire and reading Revelation in the context of its Roman imperial setting, right? So this is just a little sampling of all the books, uh, some books that are looking at the text of Revelation, and look, empire, right? Apocalypse and empire, spectacles of empire, empire and apocalypse, empire, 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 empire. So there's this fixation on the book of Revelation in the context of the Roman Empire. Now, there are schools of thought, schools of thought, uh, in approaching apocaly apocalyptic literature. Now, some of you may have already... Pastor Miguel, did you guys already talk about the historicist school? And the, okay, you already talked about that, so I won't bore you with that, right? So it's interesting that in the Adventist tradition, right, there is a critique of, of, of this fixation of revelation being about the Roman Empire. And in a sense, we lose something by not taking at least something from that historical context. Because in the Adventist tradition, right, we want to see this in its, in its cosmic scope, right? This is not just, this is a document not simply talking about the Roman Empire in the first century. This is a document that has something to say about human civilization in subsequent uh, you know, generations and years. But we lose something because John is writing, the author who's identified as John, is writing at a specific time in history. And he's writing, it is believed, during the, the, the 90s, during the, the, the last decade of the first century, under the reign of Emperor Domitian, right? And we know that he's writing from a little, let's see, do I have a, do I have a little um, pointer? I don't. He's writing from a little island called Patmos, which you've heard, and he's writing to a series of Christian communities in what they called Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey, right? And I can't point you too close, but he's writing from an island right off the people who are receiving his letter. They're under Roman imperial rule, okay? So in the air, as John is writing, if you were to ask John, hey, John, is this document a political document, right? Well, he's writing as an exile. How do we know that? He literally, wait, did we, why don't we read that? Can somebody read Revelation chapter 1? I guess we probably should read it. We're talking about it. Can somebody read Revelation chapter 1? And let's read verse 9. And you may have already uh, covered this, but let's look at it in this context. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9. Who's got it? Don't be shy. Loud and clear. Okay, so we know he's exiled 
on an island, and he tells us that the reason, the occasion for his exile is he's under persecution. So already, the definitions we lined up for what is politics, John is already living in that realm. He's breathing that political air because he's a political exile, right? And he's writing because he's under persecution. So already we have the relationship with, between the individual and authority figures and structures of authority, structures of power, and the abuse of power. And so as John writes this document, um, it's, it's, like, it's like a commentary from there that takes on cosmic, a cosmic scope. We have a literal empire, and then it goes macro, and then we are told that the same principles, antagonistic principles that exist in the Roman Empire with this community of the way of the followers of Jesus will take on cosmic implications throughout history, right? John suggests that the message of Jesus, hear me now, is a threat to Rome. Else, what is he doing on this island? You with me so far? In its original political and religious setting, Revelation will make satire of Roman versions of reality. John develops his work in an anti-imperialist tone where he sharply criticizes Roman imperialism. Now, the people who are reading John Right, here we are sitting in Southern California, so far removed. But the people who are reading John, it's quite fresh in their memory that the one whom they followed, the one whom they are named after, right, Christ Eans, Jesus himself was executed, was tried and executed as a, or on the charge of sedition against the Roman Empire, Right? Which tells us why, when John is writing, it is explicit that the message of Jesus is a threat to Rome. So is the gospel, does the gospel have inherent political implications? Is there a, uh, the, the gospel's inherent political philosophy, is there a political philosophy that's inherent in just the gospel? What, would, what, what do you think? You're just staring at me funny. <laughs> For all who believe. Let me put it to you this way. When John and his fellow believers are announcing that Jesus is king, and when they're announcing Jesus as the Christ, right? Jesus Christ, that those words roll off our tongue way too comfortably. Jesus the Christ. That's like in vogue in our political culture. But what if you were to rewind and travel back in time and you're living in first century Judea, Roman, right, under Roman rule, and you're walking around announcing this, this messianic figure who is the Messiah, which you and I know it means the anointed, right, it's funny, I always tell my students, I said, if you lined up 10 people on the street and said, um, my name, you know, I'm Jeffrey Rosario, right, Miguel Mendez, right, Pastor Philip, I can't pronounce your last name. Um, <laughs> um, if you were to line up people and say, what was, first say your first and last name, and then say, what was Jesus' last name? Come on, folks, what are they going to say? Christ. That's Jesus' last name, right? That's what they're going to say. And you and I know, that's not Jesus' last name, right? The word Christ is a Help me out. A title. It's a title. Furthermore, it is a politically, hear me now, charged title. Because Messiah, okay, that notion of Messiah has a long history. And that long history tells us that Messiah would come as the anointed king of Israel. The anointed what, everybody? King. Now, that's a problem because when Jesus was born and he's announced king of the Jews, right, people start getting nervous. People start getting nervous. So, so the word Christ ha is politically charged because in its original setting in the Roman Empire, it was you were making a political claim. You were following the Christ, which is the rightful king. You see, if Jesus is the rightful king, then somebody isn't. Somebody else is not, right? <laughs> If Jesus is the rightful king, then Caesar is not. Yeah. 
You look at me funny again. <laughs> and then not only are they announcing Jesus as Messiah, which is already a problem, then they're walking around saying, Messiah is, uh, we are bearing the gospel again. That stuff rolls off our tongue very easy. Now, N.T. Wright, which some of us love here, N.T. Wright has done deep study in this, pointing out that gospel evangelion, right? Glad tidings, good news. We think that the Christian community invented that. Like that's Christian lingo in our modern context. Gospel, Christian lingo. Well, no, no, that, 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 was, that, already, that concept already existed in the Roman setting before the Christians showed up. And the gospel, Evangelion, was the good news, the glad tidings that was announcing the accession of a new Roman emperor, right? Or the birthday of the ruler. And now come these like ragtag, uneducated, right? People on the peripheral of Roman society and they're announcing gospel this and gospel that. And here's John in Revelation 14, the final message for this world, the everlasting, right? Um, that carries deep political implications. You follow what I'm saying? Because they're saying we're not out here to announce or to celebrate the accession of a new uh, uh, Caesar, but our gospel is to proclaim a new, a different kind of king, and it is emphatically not Caesar, right? So this idea of the everlasting gospel in the book of Revelation... Well, go figure, the guy sitting on an island, <laughs> exiled, <laughs> right? He's the last one, right? He's the last man standing. He's the last of the Mohicans, right? He's in the late 90s, and he's the last one standing, and he's tasting, he's getting a taste for how edgy, politically edgy it, it was to be those of the way. And then you get to one of the key concepts, because this is apocalyptic literature, and there is, you know, collision course, there's, there's good, there's evil, and then this concept of war, this concept of war in the book of Revelation. But one thing that is really interesting, again, we're just kind of sampling, right, textually, uh, the political implications of Revelation, right? We're not, we're not going all the way in, we're just sampling, but... When you go into the book of Revelation, you repeatedly find the concept of war, war. Now, I didn't put it up on the screen. I don't want to overwhelm with a bunch of words up there. But this, uh, scholars have pointed out, is one of the most important words in the book of Revelation. Now, the interesting thing about war is that it comes from the Greek word polemos, right? And polemos is where we get our English word polemics. Now, think about this for a second. When it says there was war in heaven between the Christ kingdom and the rebellion, what does that mean that there was war in heaven? Now, I'll tell you what I thought. I never read it until I was 17 years old. I never picked up the Bible until I was 17 years old. And when I got to that, I'll be honest with you. When I think of war and when I read that in Revelation, I literally thought, you know, shing, like they're ching. They're going to war with, like, that's my only conception of war, or big tanks and military weaponry, right? I mean, how else do you conceive of war? I don't know, but my hunch is that when Revelation 12 talks about war in heaven, it's possible that it's not referring to tanks and grenades. Are you guys with me? There's a possibility, right? Maybe it has something to do, and maybe, maybe we just, this is a cheap shot from our English reading, right? Maybe this notion of polemics gets us closer to the issue that's really taking place in this cosmic controversy between good and evil in the book of Revelation. You following me? Now, when you think of the word polemics, what comes to your mind? Other than you and your wife in the car in traffic. <laughs> Arguments? Sorry? Opinion, arguments, disagreements, polarization, right? 
we're on the same page, right? When I think of the word polemics, I think in the realm of ideas and in the realm of claims and accusations. Are you guys, are you guys following what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't want to take this too far, but it kind of sounds like a, like, a, like a political campaign. Maybe Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, and there was war in heaven. Let's do that again. And there was polemics in heaven. Maybe it's telling us that in heaven, there was a, a, a moment in time where there was a break, and at the heart of that break was arguments, accusations, and challenges, right? like you would see in a political campaign. In other words, there was a challenge to the existing, to the incumbent, right? To the existing government, right? And this is the realm. It's not, shing! I mean, what was the, the, the start? The, I'm not really a Star Wars, or is it Star Wars or Star Trek? See, that, that's the nature of my ignorance. The Darth Vader thing, right? That's not, maybe you see Keepers of the Flame, right? And much respect to Keepers of the Flame. That, that documentary show, but they, they have, you know, no, we're talking about the realm of ideas. So tell me, tell me, this is one of the most important words, polemos, in the book of Revelation. So let me ask you the question, is, does the book of Revelation carry with it political implications? Now, of course, it does mean war, right? Um, but, but if we dig a little deeper, perhaps our English, you know, cheat sheet, gets us closer to what the heck is going on in the text. And if, that, if, if we can get there, we can really appreciate the significance of, of what this book is bringing to us. Right? It protects us from the hyper-literalism, and it protects us from seeing this so localized that it, 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 it's, got, it's got no fangs. Right? It's got nothing to say to subsequent generations. So, Revelation, this cosmic struggle, right? John the Revelator sitting on this island, the prospects he's going to rot in his cell, right? Because he's under the political boot of the Roman uh, rule. And he's writing this incredible cosmic apocalyptic vision, and he needs to depict... Okay, I'm going to take you for a quick ride here. He needs to depict King Jesus and the kingdom of Jesus and Yahweh, right? He needs, to, he needs to frame for us the absolute power and majesty that God is in his ultimate victory over, over the powers of darkness, right, and the powers of evil. And as he's thinking, okay, how will I depict that? He needs to lay out for us, uh, what does he need to lay out for us? The power of God. Listen to all these words. Follow with me here. Power, supremacy, dominion, conqueror, ruler. This is the kind of God John needs to depict, right, to capture the final victory that Revelation draws us to, right? And as he scans throughout the Old Testament, because Revelation is, is deeply based on the Old Testament. You would have known that by now, I think. Um, as he scans throughout the Old Testament for, for the imagery, for the appropriate pattern, the appropriate symbols that will capture the power, supremacy, dominion, the conqueror, the rulership, the lordship of God. I'm trying to build you up for like a, a moment. Can you work with me here? Can you be on the edge of your seat, right? Which image will he invoke to capture all that? And of course, this is the image, okay? This is the image that John the Revelator invokes as the most powerful depiction that can capture. What are we trying to capture? I forgot already. The power, supremacy, dominion, the conqueror, the ruler. This is the image that John chooses to capture all of that for us. Okay, now, you tell me. If this has political implication. Now, you're saying, oh, right, I mean, this is, he just looked for the cutest picture of a little lamp. You know, that's not fair, 
right? It says lamb, right? No, no, no. In the Greek, it literally means little or small lamb. Now notice, he doesn't say the lamb. The word he uses, and I'm not a Greek scholar. I went to the dictionary for this. The word that he uses is little or small lamb. Okay, on purpose. There's, over, there's some 30 different titles that, that King Jesus is given in the book of Revelation. Out of mercy, I'm not going to take you through that, right? But there's many options that he could have chosen to really lean into. And yet, the word lamb as a designator for Jesus and King Jesus occurs 28 times. And if you want to do the math, if you're nerdy like that, see me afterwards. I can give you the, the deets on that. It, every other title pales in comparison to this symbol of the lamb. Come on now. You just stole my thunder, brother. I'm getting there, but thank you for this. Because we're not just talking about a lamb, as the brother said. We're talking about a slain lamb. Okay, again, I'm not telling you this just for fun because I like cute lambs, right? I'm telling you because this is the obsession of our author. And this obsession has massive, in my opinion, political implications as expressed by Barbara Rossing. I like this. Check this out. The lamb is an amazing and yet wonderfully disarming vision. In the face of Rome's ideology of victory, the victorious lamb of Revelation looks almost incongruous. In place of overwhelming military strength, Roman Empire, we are given the image of the lamb's nonviolent power. In place of Rome's image of inflicting slaughter on the world, Revelation tells the story of the lamb who has been slaughtered and who still bears the scars, brother, of that slaughter. This reversal of images must have come as a big surprise to first century Christians, accustomed as they were to Rome's images of power and victory. Revelation undertakes to reveal what true power and true victory is. At the heart of the power of the universe stands Jesus, God's slain lamb. Think about the implications of that, because what is happening here? That new ruler that has been announced, that Messiah, that rightful ruler that has displaced the Caesars in the minds of these followers, in the minds of our author, right? That ruler... Um, is depicted with an image that completely turns upside down our notions of power. Because according to the book of Revelation, what you and I perceive as powerful and authority gets completely turned on its head. And, and it's, it's, it's beautifully intentional. And it's brilliantly done. And I know, Miguel, you were talking about last week about the Greek is kind of sloppy. Um, and I get all that, but I, I just want to call this a masterpiece of apocalyptic literature uh, in the way that it is just crafted. It's just brilliantly done, despite uh, some of these textual things. Now, when it talks about the lamb, so, so there's political implications there. I'm not going to beat that dead horse. I'm going to assume you guys get what I'm going there, and it's huge. Um, in the context of Rome, it's charting out a radically different political uh, vision, right? for this community. So I, I, won't, I won't dive into application after application for that. I, I trust that you guys get where I'm going with this. But when we say that the central, that, that the most often used symbol for Jesus in the, this apocalyptic book is the lamb, we know this is borrowing from, deeply from the Old Testament, right? And this leads me to another point. Not only is the lamb a central point, a political point here, but also under, like, the underpinnings of the book of Revelation is this story from the Old Testament. Revelation, if you map it out, it's telling the story, or should we say retelling the story, of, I'm going to call the most, uh, what am I calling this? The exodus from, Jesus, uh, from Egypt is the most politically significant event in the Old Testament. Why am I here? We were just in lamb, 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 lamb. Well, where did our author, John the Revelator, get this notion of the lamb, right? 
We're going right back to where that tradition comes. He's dipping. He's dipping from sources. And the source he's dipping from is, is this rich tradition of Exodus, of the wilderness experience, and of the world that the Lamb does. Now, I'm going to say that the Exodus from Egypt is arguably the most politically charged event in the entire Old Testament. And then I'm going to say that the eschatological exodus is the matrix through which John interprets God's vision of deliverance in a new kind of world. So you see mapped out through the book, it's a recapitulation of God's deliverance uh, from Egyptian bondage. And John when John envisions God's political vision of God's kingdom, he sees that as playing out with this in the backdrop. Now, that's really significant. Why? Because I just suggested to you, uh, John, our author, is drawing from the most politically charged tradition in the Old Testament as the backdrop for his work, which suggests Let's, let's, let's pull that political implication from that source and, and, and fuse it right into this new work. I don't know if that's making any sense. Echoes of Exodus, we'll do this really quickly. Um, the plagues. This is just me trying to prove to you that what I'm saying is textual. The plagues. We have the plagues in, in the book of Exodus, and the plagues play a prominent role here in the apocalypse, right? In the, in the book of Revelation. That's not an accident, right? It's not an accident. We have false teachers. We have early on in the book of Revelation, uh, John attributes the work of deception to those, those of Balaam, the, the ways of Balaam. He's, he's, he's pointing us back to chapters in the story of Israelite deliverance from Egypt and through the wilderness and the false teachers that impeded Israel from entering into the promised land. He, he's drawing from the Exodus story. The dwelling with God or God dwelling among them, I should have said. Um, in Exodus, the whole point of that whole journey in the wilderness of the sanctuary was, what is it, Exodus 25, verse 8? That I may dwell among them. Well, you read Revelation chapter 7. And what's the project here? That there's the temple of God. Why? Because God is seeking to dwell among them. Same language, same phraseology. It's drawn from the same source. Eagle's wings. I'll take you to the text for this one. Exodus 19, you'll remember this. After the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, they came to the wilderness of Sinai. And the Lord called Moses from the mountain saying, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. That's a very Exodus poetic imagery. You get to revelation and surprise. It shows up again. Then the, moment, the woman fled into another wilderness where she has a place prepared by God, the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, there we go again, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and a time and a half the time from the presence of the serpent. Um, these things are not accidental, is my point. We have the kingdom of priests. You remember in Exodus 19, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Speak this to the children of Israel. You get to Revelation, you see the same thing in Revelation chapter 5. You see the throne room of God, and then this, this hymn of praise, you are worthy. You have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, tongue, and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our gods. And then uh, the new song. This is like explicit, right? You remember this, Exodus 15, the story tells us that the Israelites make it across the Red Sea and they immediately enter into a triumphant song, and it is called the Song of Moses. That's Exodus 15. Then we get to Revelation 15, and we have the apocalyptic scene of the redeemed, and they're standing on another kind of sea, the sea of glass. Notice it doesn't need to be parted anymore. It's the sea. They're standing on it. Come on now. Anyway, don't get distracted with that. Stop distracting me. Uh, the victorious sing a song called the Song of Moses and the Song of... The that's from the text. I'm not making that... That's from the text, okay? You get to the point where you're like, man, this is very suspicious. John the Revelator is obsessed, hear me now, with the most politically charged event in the Old Testament. And that's what he's using to capture God's vision, God's political vision for what a, what, what a world could be, according to God's dreams. I don't know. It seems to me 
Like maybe it's all connected. The Exodus event was to engrave in their memory God's liberating act on their behalf. Their destiny hinged on preserving for future generations that history from Exodus. And John carries that history. This is a really, really powerful piece in the New York Times. Um, I, think, I think the title of the article was something like, if there was, if there was no Exodus, if there was no Moses in Exodus or something like that. Very powerful piece. I recommend it. A few excerpts from that. This will launch me now. Oh, mercy. This is going to launch me into some contemporary, I think, application. Exodus is read not as a remembrance of a one-time event, but as an eternal promise, a frame of reference for all future struggles, including those we face in our time and in our country. Okay. Now, when you hear Exodus, think Revelation, because I'm trying to flatten the thing and tell you that the one... Like, they, they flow. This is an archetypal redemption story, a reminder that as much as the world has changed since ancient times, oppression, degradation, exploitation remain part of the human condition. As long as there is power, there will be abuses of power. Right? That is so revelation. By, but Exodus is also a reminder that any moment could be the inflection point between oppression and liberation. And so the telling and retelling of the story are the closest we come to the generational transmission of hope. And this is an act of spiritual resistance. The Exodus narrative demands of us full partnership in the grueling, unending work of building a just society. One that stands as counter-testimony to the brutality the Israelites experienced in Egypt or read in Rome, right? What is she doing? She's late to the game because John already beat her to the punch. That's the whole point of Revelation. Everything you just read, I'm suggesting to you, is embedded in the vision of the book of Revelation. That's what it's saying. It's saying God has a vision for a different kind of world. And let me map that out to you in, in a cosmic sweep of this, these antagonistic principles between these two kingdoms that are intention, and you, me, we're stuck in the middle of it all, trying to make sense of it. Why do we read the book of Revelation? To help us make sense of it. Okay. It is popularly conceived that people who are Revelation people are fixated with the future. The apocalyptic groups, this is, by the way, from historians, like my PhD, as mentioned, was in, in history, and my work was in political advocacy from communities that, that are reading the text, and it is animating their resistance uh, to government policy, right? So it has been popularly believed for many years that people who are into Revelation or the apocalypse are obsessed with the end of the world, the end of the world fixated with the future, with the future, with the future, right? The whole too, how does it go? Too heavenly minded for any earthly good, right? That whole thing. But that's completely, that's completely an oversimplification. It is true that the book of Revelation contains uh, eschatology, right? There's a vision for what's, what's to come. But the, the apocalypse, the very word, has nothing to do with fixation with the future. Are you with me? The very word, I shouldn't say nothing to do, it doesn't have, it's not exclusively about the future. It is an unveiling. That's what it means, a revealing. That's why it's called the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, right? So what is being unveiled? What's the thing that we're lifting the curtain to see? Chapter 1, verse 1, that's the opening act. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, Right? And so, let's think about that. What is being unveiled is a new way to think about the world. What is being unveiled is a particular perspective about what's ultimate in society, which calls into question status quo claims or power claims. These apocalypticists were primarily engaged in the project of resisting 
imperial power. Now, I don't believe this is fixated in the first century Roman Empire. I think this is a cosmic thing. They were not fixated merely on fanciful flights from reality, but they were focused on the here and now as well. And they were challenging, I like this language, imperial accounts of reality and imperial domination over individual lives. The abuse of power, right? That's why Revelation brings a magnifying glass to the relationship of the indiv between the individual and the structures of power. It's a dangerous book because it empowers the individual with a different kind of vision of what God intended this to be like, right? So, really quickly here, throughout history, it's interesting to me, I'm still working on this, so guinea pigs, you are. <laughs> um, it's interesting to me that some of the significant movers and shakers in political advocacy for human rights, for social equity, for racial equity, right? for the separation, for religious liberty, were animated by a very close reading of the book of Revelation. These people, interestingly enough, did not walk away from the book of Revelation and be just so fixated with the future that they are completely oblivious to what's happening on this world right now in this society. The opposite. For example, Roger Williams. Roger Williams, right? 17th century. Um, Rhode Island, Puritan, comes over from England, ends up in Massachusetts Bay, and he runs into the Puritan community in New England, and they're really gung-ho, right? And he is reading the book of Revelation, and I will not, I'm going to try to discipline myself not to go deep into this, but here this picture, he is in the wilderness alone, and he's fleeing. Why is he fleeing? <laughs> he's fleeing because the Puritans, right, the religious folk are on his, on his back. They're, they're, they're chasing him, right? Why? Because he blew the trumpet in, in, in New England, in Massachusetts Bay Colony. Why? Because he saw there the abuse of power, the mingling between religious and civil uh, abuses, right? And the blurring of religious liberty, et cetera, et cetera. And so he blew the trumpet and he um, dissented from it and he broke from Massachusetts. And that's why eventually he made it to, and became the founder of the Rhode Island Colony. Now, why do I bring this up to you? Because if you read James Byrd's uh, scholarly work, he has, and he didn't even try to do this. It's like he does this in passing. But, of course, I, I hit the brakes on when I read this. And he says he mapped out every single citation in the corpus, in the published writings of Roger Williams, right? And, he, and he, he, he tabulated which Bible verses was this guy into. And the most cited in all of his public works is the book of Revelation over 300 times. Specifically... That little, that little section between Revelation 13 and Revelation 17. And I'll just leave you there with that. Okay? Though the, that's the stuff he was on, right? So check this out. He read that and he was like, wait, what's happening here? And he became a political dissenter. He began to criticize the government policies of, 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 of Massachusetts Bay because of his reading of Revelation fired him up to a particular vision. Very interesting, I think. What about Frederick Douglass? Frederick Douglass, the great advocate for the marginalized, the great political advocate, he was animated by apocalypticism in his efforts on behalf of the oppressed. He was reading the book of Revelation, and it painted a picture to him that really helped now, I'm not suggesting this is his sole, only source for, for what he did, but he was steeped in the book of Revelation, and it actually animated him. So did other uh, reformers for racial equity like Nat Turner. Some of the slave revolts took place because the, 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 slave community, the enslaved community was reading the book of Exodus and was reading the book of Revelation. You go figure. Why is that dangerous? If you're one that has... People under oppression, 
You want to keep the peace? Do not give them access to Exodus or Revelation. Because if you give them access to that, they're going to catch a vision of what this thing is supposed to be about. <laughs> and it's going to inspire resistance. Is the book of Revelation political? Um, and to land the plane here, we get, because we're already in the 19th century with Frederick, right? We get to this early generation, early community of Seventh-day Adventists. Now, the interesting thing about this particular case study is here we have an American-born apocalyptic movement, right? It takes very seriously readings of the book of Revelation. We have here uh, A.T. Jones, who I really, really like. We have Ellen White, and we have Louis Sheaf, who's one of the prominent African-American uh, Adventist preachers at the time. And what you find is you find very dangerous, I'm using the word dangerous loosely here, very dangerous theology in each of these works. Why, are this, why is this dangerous theology? Because this theology draws attention to these texts that paint this picture um, that put a magnifying glass to the issue of human rights, to the issue of the individual's relationship to authority powers, to the rise and fall of empires, to legitimate government, to when is it just to disobey the government, and that stuff is dangerous. So um, maybe to jump here, I'll put it this way. While John the Revelator wrote in the first century in the shadow of the Roman Empire, early Adventists invoked this ancient text to level a political critique against Rome 2.0, wow. uh -oh. the United States of America. Uh -oh. <sighs> now we're in trouble. Yeah. Now we are in trouble. Rome 2.0. And what they see fires them up. Now, my favorite generation of Adventism, I, think, I call this the golden years, is the 1890s and into the 90s. That's what I did my dissertation on, so clearly I'm partial. But this is the generation, that those, those decades there, 1890s to 19, 1903, 4, is a generation where I find an incredibly impressive political acumen, like their reading of, of what's happening in the world around them is absolutely fascinating. And it's driven by dangerous texts like this one. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a, come on guys, I set you up for this one. We already did the heavy lifting. Two horns like a lamb. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Could you imagine them reading this for the first time? By the way, 1851, Jay and Andrews publishes the first Adventist articulation of this crazy idea, right? Politically explosive idea. They see a power coming on to the stage, to the world stage. And I, I won't get into all of this for obvious reasons. It'll take us a long time. But, but he gets, they see this power come onto the world stage, the political stage, and they see that John the Revelator, who they believe, right, is, is seeing in cosmic vision the same principles, right, that were local in the Roman Empire, that Jesus says, I will show you what shall surely come to pass. He sees this with laser, right, they believe. And so this power has two horns like a lamb, and they're like, wait a second. The book of Revelation mentions the lamb 28 times, but it's actually 29 times because I left that one out, right? Or did I include it? I think I left that one out. But this is the one instance in the book of Revelation where the word lamb is used, right? And it's not in reference specifically to Jesus directly, but it's referencing to a power that is, hear me now, masquerading to resemble lamb. It is masquerading to resemble lamb power when in reality, it just looks like a lamb. But the minute it opens its mouth, it's got dragon breath. 
Okay. So I basically spent three years in England reading published materials, right? Stuff like the United States in Prophecy, The Peril of the Republic, written by Percy T. McGann. Percy T. McGann. Come on, are you guys hardcore Loma Linda folks or what? We'll get to them. Right? You're pointing that direction, right? It's like, wait, we've seen that name on the building around here somewhere. But hold on, hold on. We're not there yet. It's only 8 o'clock. We got another hour. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Okay, so check this out. So I spent three years pouring through the Adventist press. The American Sentinel, New York, Science of the Times in California, and our friends in Michigan, the Review and Herald, right? And what you see is utterly fascinating. Because in this particular historical moment, at the turn of the 20th century, the United States, who has been uh, projecting an image of this is a Christian nation, this is a nation that stands for civil and religious liberty, et cetera, et cetera, right? They're seeing this nation on the world stage, and it is speaking like a dragon, okay? Now, the two horns of this purportedly lamb nation, they believe represent civil and religious liberty, the two operative principles, right, of the republic, which is why when I showed you this book, McGann calls his book The Peril of the Republic. Come on now. Okay, so... So, so this literature, they're, they're, they're critiquing uh, particular events that are taking place in their day, and my work was specifically in American foreign policy, but I looked at how Adventists saw United States domestic policy. They looked at the history of slavery. They looked at the history of religious persecution and intolerance in the country. They looked at all of that domestically, and then they mapped that out to show this was a precursor for what this empire we call the United States is now doing, flexing its power around the world, right? Which is heavy. So check this out. The American Sentinel, you can't see this, and I apologize for that, and I don't have a laser here, but here you have, this is front page, okay? This is wartime America, right? We're at war here. We're at war because the United States is trying to colonize the Philippines, We've instituted, we've instituted military rule in the Philippines. Um, I'll get to that in a second. But here we have a picture, front, front page of the American Sentinel. And <clears throat> you have Satan there, right? And you have Columbia, right? Lady Liberty or whatever, sitting down. Her crown says Liberty. And on her hand there on the left, you have the founding documents, the U.S. Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. And Satan, he has on his chest here, it says despotism, and he has this, whatever you call that, and it has imperialism waving. And off to the distance, we have the Pacific, and we have two islands. We have to the left, we have the Philippines, and to the right, we have Hawaii, and then we have worldwide empire. And I apologize, this was a miscalculation on my part, because I'm not even getting into what this war was all about, and I apologize for that, but I just wanted to show you this, even though I'm not really explaining why this was a big deal at the time. But in short, the United States went to war with the Spanish Empire and completely demolished the Spanish Empire, and the, Fil the Philippines was under Spanish rule, and they were crying out for liberation and for freedom, and the United States said, sure, we'll help you, no problem, we'll help you get freedom, right? After the United States crushed the Spanish, the United States government then entered into a room of negotiation with the Spanish and take a wild guess who was not at the table, the Filipinos, and they cut a deal and they wrote a check. Here's a $20 million check for the, we want to purchase the Philippines from you. And the purchase was made, and that's called the Treaty of Paris, December 10, 1898. And in that moment, the United States became colonizing power over the Philippines. And the Filipinos, meanwhile, are waiting, exciting, because they believe they've been liberated. And the U.S. military shows up, they take down the Spanish flag, and they put up the American flag. 
and war breaks out. And we call that the Filipino-American War, which nobody knows about. So if you're like, huh? Perfectly normal. Nobody knows about it. This is the moment, right, that I'm talking about. And the Adventists are like, they're reading Revelation. In the context of this empire background that I've been trying to lay down for us. And at the time, you see stuff like this. The only reason the United States was, was wanting to colonize the Philippines was not to liberate them, obviously, but it's because it was a stepping stone to, to China. So this empire, this lamb-like, Jesus-like empire, <laughs> was really trying to figure out how to flex its military, diplomatic, and economic dominance over the world. And uh, sorry, I, I, I don't have time for that. But, but, but you get stuff like this, right? This is um, 1899. At the same time, the Adventist press is talking. This is the harvest. Why does it say the harvest? Because at this time in American history, the entire religious sector in the United States, let me rephrase that, bring it closer to home. Protestant America was the loudest supporter for American colonization of foreign peoples abroad. And the reason was because we need to take the gospel to them. Right? And so this is the harvest in the Philippines. The Lord gave us these souls. Life was edgy. Right? So this is what you have going on here. And so... Couple more, I promise. This is from Signs of the Times. This is the year 1900 now. And this is what it says. I, I've specifically selected stuff that will quickly get me to where I need to get, but I assure you, it is overwhelming the stuff I can that we can we can read together. It's just like overwhelming. For years, this was going on in the Adventist press. Political critique informed by readings of Revelation. This quote, this great republic, in harmony with the prophecy of inspiration, pray tell, what prophecy would you guess they're referring to? Revelation 13, the lamb-like beast. This republic, in harmony with the prophecy of inspiration, is repudiating the very principles of its existence and is becoming an imperialism. And then it almost like corrects itself. The republic still exists in name. The empire is here. Now, if we could appreciate that if you said that at that time, you were a walking target. Because one thing we know, any historian will tell you, in wartime America, don't mess around. Right? Just zip, zip it. Because in wartime America, that's the last time to be running your, your mouth about the sense against the U.S. government. So this is happening at a, at a time where Adventists are, are, they're like over here in the corner, blowing the trumpet, and the entire Protestant establishment is front and center, driving enthusiasm for American imperialism. And so I, I looked at my work, why is that community stick out so weirdly? And my answer is partly, because of the way the book of Revelation was informing their political philosophy. Okay, now we get to our dude, McGann. So McGann um, was the president of Loma Linda University for many years. He was the dean of um, the School of Medicine. And he is where the McGann Hall or McGann, whatever you call it, that's where the current administration, that's where the offices are, right, to this day. McGann is a big name. Uh, it's thanks to him during World War I that this institution received his legit accreditation, et cetera. He's a, big, he's a big deal. But what most people don't know is that before he became known as the Loma Linda administrator physician guy, he was on the cutting edge of political advocacy and dissent, criticizing government policies and the abuse of power wow. of the United States of America. Wow. And just snip it. He gets criticized for that because they're like, we need, to, we need to tread carefully here. And so he is looking for encouragement, so he writes to Ellen White. But at the time, Ellen White is 
um, receiving letters, but he's saying, hey, address letters to my son, right? And that's why McGann writes to Willie White. This is March 16, 1900. He's in regular communication with her, right? And he writes this. I know that some of our people have done a great deal of harm by engaging in politics. Yet I feel that there is some danger now that men who are conscientious and careful will not realize the difference between politics on the one hand and telling truths to those in high places on the other. So in other words, there is a difference, according to Mr. McGann, between getting sucked into partisan politics and the messiness of all of that and standing on a particular vantage point in being able to speak truth to those in power, i.e., we can legitimately engage in political dissent, he says, without getting sucked in to the traps of partisan politics. It's important for him to say that because at the time, and I wish still today, it was very much thick in Adventist culture to avoid partisan politics, to not identify with some political party, but to stand on the vantage ground and to be able to speak to issues going on in the world without any entanglings or alliances. Um, and we'll close with this. C.P. Bowman. Why am I closing with him? Because he doesn't get any light of day. In fact, be honest, you don't have a clue who this guy is. <laughs> right? So, long-time administrator, editor. In my work, he's a big dog that nobody has heard of. But he writes this. This is in the Sentinel. We cannot avoid individual responsibility in this matter. He's talking about the political and government policies of the day. By remaining silent spectators. He who fails to protest when his neighbor's rights are invaded and who by that failure gives to that invasion the sanction of silent consent forfeits thereby the right to protest when his own rights are trampled underfoot. <laughs> this nation was established upon the principle that rights are God-given and inalienable, and that governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. We're, we're in political philosophy territory now. This principle involves both, what everybody? Civil and religious liberty. In other words, go back and read Revelation 13, because there's two horns on that beast, right? Civil and religious liberty. It is either true of all peoples everywhere, or it is not true of any people anywhere. <laughs> All right, we need to be merciful here. We need to bring this to a close. But I'm suggesting to you that these tropes in popular culture, that apocalyptic communities, present company included, uh, people who take revelation seriously are siloed, yeah? They're just obsessed with, with this imaginary, you know, future world that they are no good to the current society. That, in fact, that is a gross aberration from both John's text and the way subsequent generations have read John the Revelator. Revelation is a political document. It is a powerful vision for a new kind of world, one that envisions King Jesus and everything that that, that, that implies for followers on here. So sorry for being long, but thank you. Are we staying up here? You think they're going to stay after that? Um, that was that was invigorating exciting, challenging. I know that you all have some questions, maybe some comments. We want to hear those. As always, my job up here is simply to repeat that for our audience online. And so we'll start with Marilyn back there. Hmm. 
So Maryland, for those of you at home, uh, just graduated college about 10 years ago. <laughs> and during her research, uh, she focused on the years leading up to World War I. Uh, and uh, we've, we've all read about Adventist positions on uh, Turkey and the Ottomans. So something shifted, I think, is what, what she's asking. Jeff, could you comment on that? Well, I don't even know if we would say something shifted. Uh, what I don't want to leave the impression is that this particular generation was not apocalyptic in future. They certainly were, right? You don't ever get five minutes in Adventist history where the church is not deeply steeped in the second coming of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus. So I, I, I don't mean to give that impression. It's just for the sake of time. I'm just, I'm just trying to highlight the particular point. That's always been there. But the case you're bringing up about Turkey, it's in my opinion, hugely embarrassing. Because it, our, you know, our GC president, A.G. Daniels, is going around the country telling Turkey, Turkey, and he's drawing. So you highlight a very important point there, that with being an apocalyptic community, we are very vulnerable to weird stuff, to weird interpretations. It's just the fact of the matter. There's, I don't think there's any way to dance around that. They were so sure right, that the fall of the Ottoman Empire and the taking of Jerusalem and all that would be significant anyway, and, it, and it, it just seems like it was nothing. And it's funny because I have a buddy of mine who did work on that, and after that all went down, nothing happened. A.G. Da Daniels was like, yeah, so anyways, um, let's move on. I was like, whoa, 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 bro, what do you mean let's move on? <laughs> you literally went on a world tour, and he was just like, whoop, let's move on, right? It's embarrassing. So I would just say, um, what changed? I don't know if anything changed. I think we've always been susceptible and vulnerable to weird interpretations, to, to, to getting the text to answer questions that John wasn't asking, right? Getting the text to do things that it wasn't, it's not out to do. So, uh, yeah, that, that's, I'm not sure what else to say. By the way, though, World War I, that's like the last chapter in my work, and what I'm showing is, that World War I is when the government, like this is, what I shared with you is 1899, 1900, 1901, and then it kind of dies out. But World War I, the federal government issues the Sedition Act and the Espionage Act. That's 1917, 1918. And it literally becomes illegal. Like none of these guys were arrested for the stuff I shared with you up on the screen. They were just, it was just social, they lost social capital. They were criticized, ridiculed. But 1917, 1918, Adventists are arrested, right, federal legislation. So even in World War I, I don't think it changes yet because they're given the ultimatum, stop on this whole nonsense about Revelation 13, we're at war, or face the consequences. And the church goes through this very difficult time. And my friend um, Kevin Burton, Michael Campbell, these are all these other Adventist historians, they're, they're, we're all kind of trying to map that out, right? So I don't think anything changes. I just think it's always been there. And, and since, 19, since World War I, we, we weren't done with Turkey, were we? we? We have all kinds of tricks in our hats since World War I. We come up with all kinds of interpretations, and then there's, there's this like back and forth, you know, are we taking the text too literally? So I just think it's, it's part of the messy work of being this type of community. I, I don't know. I don't have a, a squeaky clean way forward for that. That's, that's very helpful, Jeff. Any, any other questions? Yes, we've got a few that have, uh, that have jumped up. We'll go here, and then we'll go, we'll go back there. So the question, by the way, take us with you. Wait, wait. <laughs> we don't know where she's taking us. Where are you from? Where do you live? Norway. Take, take me with you. Norway has never has any problems. It's, it's, it's annoying. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful I've place. I've been to Norway several times, so 
So the question has to do with uh, America's penchant for having two different facts, two different sets of facts from which uh, both the right and the left, I'm assuming, uh, will, will draw for them. When there is no agreed idea on what is true, what advice, what advice could a historian as yourself give us? What I, what I always say is I think you should read CNN and Fox News. <laughs> you know, because we have to be on, we, what is it? Take heed lest he, if you think you, you, he who thinks he stands, take heed lest he falls, however that text works. Um, we could easily be in a groupthink echo chamber, right? Even those of us who think we are the enlightened one on the other side of the aisle, right? Who's to say we're not in our own echo chamber? So I was at I was at Yale University. I did my master's there, and they had a exactly what you're saying. It was during it was during a really intense uh, season in the political year where it was a um, fake news symposium. They had New York Times, they had Political, they had Washington Post, and I forget who up on the panel, right? And they posed the same question that you just posed. Um, we're being fed information, right? Most of us are not political analysts who are looking at all this firsthand. We're looking at a second, third, maybe fourth layer filtered, right? How the heck do we know that what is being fed to us corresponds to reality, right? So the guy on the, on the stage was like, and this is at Yale, right? They're liberals, right? No one in the, and he asked the question, how many of you and it was packed. How many of you read Fox News at least once a week? He asked that question. Pin drop. No, nothing. <laughs> he was like, this is our problem. This is our problem. Right. So I always say I, I, I just want, I don't want to be duped by, other, by either side. I don't want to be duped by one stream of information. So I think to, to the best as we can, as we can broaden our perspective and, and acknowledge when we're getting fed filtered stuff, it's got a slant, right? And so I try to broaden my sources as I think about something. Like my wife, and my wife is uh, Ukrainian but born in Moscow. Imagine that right now, right? Russian Ukrainian, but Ukrainian but born in Moscow. And it's a, it's a similar situation, right? Even for that community, it's like she's like, I'll watch CNN about the war in Ukraine, and then I'll, I'll look at Russian news, and then I'll look at Ukrainian news, right? She's like, it's the only way to just avoid being in a bubble. So that's what I would say. I would say humility, right? Don't just assume that your source is enlightened and progressive, and, and then the other side is just completely out of whack, because I don't know, maybe, maybe you roll like that, but I'm a very cynical person, and I have very little trust and high suspicion. <laughs> I'm very suspicious. When I hear something, I'm like, okay, maybe. Like, where's, where's the, right? Where's the evidence? So I don't know if that's helpful at all, but read that's, CNN and Fox. And if you want to get edgy, read MSNBC too. That's, 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 I think, very helpful. Back there, we had a hand. Yes, sir. Yeah, so uh, Ke um, Michael Campbell was another Irishman historian. So he looks at the period right after, right period, like he starts in World War I, and he goes into, and he, 
he, he maps that out, that there is a transition that takes place. And I don't know if we want to get into that right now, but um, there is a transition that takes place where Adventism's political dissent against the U.S. state, uh, the church begins to make efforts to be legitimized as, pro, as American, because they're viewed as anti-American, un-American, uh, because of their dissent. And so when you get on the other end of World War I, that's when efforts are made to, hey, we, we're going to get, we're going to get billed as un-American. And so there are efforts made to kind of navigate that territory. So, yeah, I can refer to you to the literature on that if you'd want so that it's an incredible story. And I, the reason I told you that I like this generation is the golden years, because it's right before all that happens. Mm. Well, um, it's interesting that now, the, what the research is showing now, that even, even the idea, and I didn't touch on this, even the idea that the beast in Revelation 13, that looks like a lamb and speaks like a dragon, is the United States of America, that one of the main reasons why Jay and Andrews and those early thinkers arrived at that is because of the existence of slave. Remember, 1851, this is pre-Civil War right? This is antebellum America. And one of the reasons that they landed on that interpretation was, look, look at this nation and look at the presence of people who are oppressed. How on earth could this be lamb-like? How could this be a Christian nation? This is clearly a power that masquerades as a lamb, but it's actually speaking like a dragon. So the context, political context around, kind of like what you were saying, was itself testimony to what they were arriving at. And now we, we don't talk about that, right? We don't talk about how social justice was a major force behind our eschatological articulation. Like we crystallize our views of Bible prophecy and social justice had a major role in that. That component has been completely forgotten, right? We just think that people sat together and started writing down numbers and calculations, and ta-da, right? But that's not the case. So I don't know if that captures your question, but um, I'm fascinated by that point anyways. We've got, we've got time for just one more hand. Yes, we'll go, we'll go right here. No, you're referring, it sounds like she's referring to 
things that have been presented before, new era. I'm not familiar with... Yeah. So I, I think if I if I can if I can kind of and it, I, I think I'm going to try to to capture uh, because I think it's it's a it's a very very important point. Um, we still have uh, in America, even in current America, a heavily laden religious language that comes uh, from the government, and mm. that is and that religious language is politicized. Mm. We're talking here about a different role uh, for churches and communities of faith, where we don't politicize religious language. We try to grapple with, with prophetic language and with, religious, with the religious lingo. How do we ensure that in this new, in this new vision of looking at, at religious language, as a polit as, without politicizing it or without leveraging, how do we establish some guardrails? I don't know if that if that kind of captures what. Uh, it's interesting because <clears throat> I'm going to shoot this, and it may or may not hit, but we can chat afterwards further. But. The early Adventists were called political atheists. Mm -hmm. And the reason they were called political atheists is because in that generation, as you're alluding to here, politics was, there was a religio-political culture, right? There were s uh, laws for, um, there was uh, advocacy for the Bible in public schools, right? There was advocacy to put Jesus in the Constitution, they wanted to rewrite the founding documents and insert God back in the Constitution. So the early Adventists were, viewed, were perceived to be political atheists because they, they envisioned political society without imposing Christianity, right? So we walk, we, we walk kind of a line with this because in, in our day and age, um, politics is very much religiously infused, right? But to me... There's a reason why Jesus refused to be enthroned, right? They were trying to make Jesus king ahead of time, and he always resisted that. He said, this is not what my kingdom is about, right? Um, I think in our day and age, we should continue in that. That's one thing I think the early Adventists got right, is that they resisted the inroads of, of religion being blurred, with religious liberty being blurred with civil liberty. And so I think that that's one pillar that they got right. So how do we know? I think moving forward, I think we go back to the image of uh, civil and re religious liberty, and we don't just advocate for one over the other. I think we advocate for both. Uh, so for me, that means I think we become astute observers of government policies, and we, we are on the lookout for anything that seems to blur the lines between civil and religious liberty in the tradition of Roger Williams. So um, anyway, we, we could talk afterwards more to, to just navigate that more, but. So well stated. I think, I think often in our, in our current political discourse, we align a certain, or we overlay a certain set of morals or morality into one of the two frameworks. And I think what really strikes me about, Jeff, what you've shared uh, tonight is that it isn't one or the other framework, what you're actually doing is you're destroying those, those frameworks in order to present a new paradigm, which I think is very much in line with what John was doing and with uh, the Jewish prophetic uh, tradition. Mm. Amen. Well, uh, we, we'll, 
We'll do one more, um, and then we'll we'll close. So this really is the last I can, one. I can also just talk afterwards. We don't yeah, have to keep yeah. everybody here. We yeah. can just talk afterwards. I'll be here. <laughs> He'll be here. So do you, is it is it short, Danilo, or you want to? Okay. And there's the answer, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, I think that's a great place to end. Jeff, thank you so much. I know that we'll be, we'll be thinking about some of these challenging ideas. We'll be thinking about how Revelation is a political document because it is uncomfortable. Mm. And the moment I think we become comfortable with our readings of the text There's is probably a, the time to go back to the text and ask new questions of it. Friends, thank you so much. Tomorrow, um, we'll see you at 9 a.m. We've got our Drayson social night. Drive safely to you online. Thank you for staying with us. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the evening. And again, thank you so much, Jeff.